Across the globe, there are places which aspire to provide the most exclusive of holiday experiences. Luxurious. What I am doing is the best you can get in the moment. Adventurous. Oh my God, lions, oh my goodness. And sometimes quirky. He is one of the most famous guests and he has a fan club. He has an Instagram of over 10,000 followers. But what challenges do these hotels face and how do they strive to be a top destination? Anybody could have bricks and mortar in the right location, but in order to stay relevant, I do think it's important to innovate. With exclusive access, we go behind the scenes. All right, now let me take you to one of our specialty suites. Following the staff who work around the clock. Guys, we need to be fast, yeah? The guest is waiting. To deliver to their guests whatever it takes to impress. When you go from one room to the other, you go into another piece of art. You notice the view is like no other in the world. All our guests love fantasy and happiness. We take care of every guest and make them feel like kings. From Asia to Arizona, Kenya to the Caribbean, Dubai to India. Step behind the scenes of some of the world's most incredible hotels. This time we're in the UK, a country recognised for its rich history and classic regal elegance. And two very different hotels which try to embody the very best of these characteristics and deliver a slice of luxury. Just off the south coast of England, standing majestically in the Solent, between the historic naval city of Portsmouth and the Isle of Wight, two unique hotels have risen from the sea. So how did two former military forts transform into a unique retreat for those who want to get away from it all? And how do you maintain quality in the middle of the sea? These are very special areas, very special historic landmarks in Portsmouth. I'm lucky enough to actually work on one of these. We've converted it, we've turned it into something I think truly amazing and truly special. It brings up the child in everybody and that's what it's about. It's so unique, I don't think there's uh, anyone else really doing it out there. It's like your own private island for 24 hours. This is like Disneyland for adults. Spitbank Fort and its neighbour No Man's Fort were built in the 1870s to protect the UK against an invasion from the French. And thanks to their sensitive restoration, these former defences now offer their guests modern accommodation combined with all the character of the Seafort's unique maritime history. You would have had a 45 to 75 ton gun in place in each of these rooms. All with their own unique features. Hole in the floor where they used to go fishing. Anti-aircraft hoist going up to the top deck. Brickwork riddled with ricochet bullets where the Royal Marines used to come out in the 20th century. After protecting Britain against German U-boats during the Second World War, the forts were finally decommissioned by the British Army in 1958. Their remote location in the middle of the Solent may make for an unusual hotel experience for their clientele, but for the staff who make the daily early morning commute, it doesn't come without its challenges. Okay, guys, would you step on again? There's not a lot of people I know who can say they have to get a boat to work every morning, and it's, a, it's a quite a selling point when you talk to friends and uh, people. So. Nature of the sea, it changes all the time. The worst I've had was before we were on the Jenny boats. So whilst we were just Spitbank, we used to use our, our smaller Solon Forts cap that only had 12 seats um, total. 
and the worst was um, the waves rolling over the top and hitting the back of the boat. Um, yeah, that was quite, quite choppy. It was uh, a f an interesting journey. Luckily for Craig, the weather for the 30-minute journey out to No Man's Fort this morning is calm and sunny. And with the hotel's 23 deluxe suites to prepare, there's plenty for staff to do as they arrive on board. For Fort Director Quentin O'Shea, the fort's impenetrable armour plating is just the start of guests' experience of the unusual heritage of this hotel. This is the first impression our guests get when they come in here. The noir, the dark entrance. Um, a lot of people at this point think of what did we get ourselves involved in. Um, and then we've got the five-ton steel door that was protected. The only entrance in and out the fort, even till today. And in the old days, if something would have gone wrong, everybody would have pulled these pins out and the five-ton door would actually close into place, as you can see, and nobody will come in or out. If you'd like to follow me, please. Wow, lighthouse. 360 view of where we are at the moment and actually just gives everybody a good sense of, uh, of the scale of where we are at the moment. Starting with obviously the Isle of Wight, our closest point of call there. Panning around to um, the busiest, probably one of the busiest sea routes into Southampton Harbour. And then if you go a little further around and past the Navy boat coming into um, a very important naval harbour, we've got Portsmouth Harbour itself with um, the Spinnaker Tower um, as a pointer for us to where the ships come in and out. It was these epic panoramic views which inspired the owner of the forts, Mike Clare, to turn this unusual location into a hotel. I was sort of successful in retailing. Uh, I used to buy and sell a load of beds, a company called Dreams. And then uh, when I sold that, um, I wasn't ready to retire, so I sort of I loved property basically and we bought some unusual properties and monastery and castles in Scotland and these forts became available. Converting Spitbank and No Man's Forts into the unique getaways they are today was a mammoth task. We're very sympathetic, we want the, to keep all the history so there are certain things we do need to do. They all have ensuite bathrooms, people want all their normal facilities, they want their Wi-Fi, they've got to comply with their health and safety regulations and fire escapes and things. But on the other hand, we want to keep this as, as people can see and see how it was. So we hopefully got the balance right. Just over 75 miles away, in the heart of London, is a very different kind of hotel which boasts an equally historic past. Located in affluent St James and Mayfair, Duke's Hotel occupies a prime position as a close neighbour to the British royal family, only five minutes' walk from Buckingham Palace. With over 110 years of history, the pressure is always on to maintain standards. We're so fortunate that we've got this beautiful little private courtyard, so elegant and so special in a wonderful place like St James. Duke's Hotel has a great history. It originally goes back historically um, years ago to when the Dukes used to stay here. The courtyard where we're sitting now was actually the turning courtyard for the horses. So the horses used to come down here and the courtyard was actually made so it was just the correct width for the horse and cart to actually turn. Only a few minutes away from London's busy shopping districts, the hotel's secluded location aims to offer its guests a welcome escape from the capital's crowded streets. Taxi driver Alan Warner has been ferrying guests to and from this exclusive address since the 1950s. This is all Piccadilly we're on. We're arriving in a few minutes at Piccadilly Circus. It's very quiet there, like being in the countryside. You can hardly hear any noise. You won't hear anything, just birds singing. And yet, a few feet away is the hustle and bustle of the city. First opened in 1908, today the venue offers a top-end restaurant, 
its own health club and a world-famous bar. And with each of its 90 bedrooms costing a minimum of £350 a night, although the mode of transport to the hotel may have changed, its clientele hasn't. They're all wealthy, comfortable people, well-travelled people. To find the hotel, you need to be well-travelled. And it's got a wonderful reputation. Food's good. Living there is good, comfortable. Porters and staff are all first class. They won't employ anybody unless they are first class. So you can't do much better than that, can you? We're just pulling in to a very narrow street, St. James's Place. I'm going to have to reverse in because you can't drive in and turn round. There is no room. Access to the hotel may be tricky, but it's this feeling of privacy, combined with the long history and traditional British values, which made it a favourite place to relax for Diana, Princess of Wales. Since taking over the reins 10 years ago, managing director Deborah Duggar has worked hard to try and keep the hotel as one of London's most revered places to stay. When I first started at the hotel, it was quite challenging because the hotel had historically always had a male general manager in the hotel. So I was the first female general manager. A lot of people think, well, what, what does it really take to run a hotel? Well, for me, you have to have lots of different hats on it because in the morning, you can be down in the breakfast room and you can be welcoming your guests and wishing them a wonderful morning. And then at 10 o'clock, you can be in a revenue meeting doing all the strategic sides of actually uh, running the business. Can we get the candles lit, please, on this tier? Can we get the candles? For Deborah, great hospitality is all in the details. So every day she makes her morning rounds, checking in with each department to ensure the hotel's 120 members of staff are providing guests with only the highest standards of service. From the minute that you actually arrive, should that be in your taxi, should that be with your chauffeur, or however you may be on foot, it's about your bag being taken away from you from the minute that you enter that door, not having to make a cup of tea yourself, your cup of tea actually made and delivered and poured for you. For those few who can afford the almost two and a half thousand pounds a night price tag, the prestigious penthouse suite offers the hotel's highest level of luxury and refinement. Head housekeeper K.K. Prabhakaran tries to ensure this home away from home is worth every penny. There's a suite lift which will take up uh, to the penthouse suite, which is uh, 511 uh, Duke of Clarence Suite. Every suite has got its name, uh, named after either a duchess or a duke. Duke's Hotel is very historic and we never want to change what it is. So yes, we invest in the hotel, but we really don't want to actually change what the hotel is. So when we do invest, we make sure that we keep that wonderful classic experience and that elegant look to the hotel. We have maintained a client base and guests do come back because they don't feel that they're coming to an hotel, rather they come to stay with their family. Now we are into the penthouse and as you could see, everything's right from the start of the bedroom. So you've got bone chinas, uh, like designer uh, china. Attention to detail, it's everything in five-star delivery, whether that's down to the flowers, down to um, the linen you use, the Egyptian cotton sheets in your bedroom. Attention to detail is key. And if people are spending a lot of money, they're looking for something special. They're not just looking for the run-of-the-mill five-star hotel. They're really looking for that uber-luxury experience. And I like to believe at Dukes, it's the uber-luxury experience that we deliver. As you could see, we got beautiful view from a balcony, uh, which will give you a view of the Green Park, uh, Westminster Abbey. So Penthouse offers a super king bed, which is massive, which our guests love the minute they walk into the room. The best part of any bedroom, like especially when they walk into a penthouse, the first thing attracts is our 
mascot, Duke C. Sometimes when the guests staying here have something different in mind for their stay, it's KK's job to ensure all their needs are met, no matter what. Every guest is different. Some might be quirky, some might be really unusual. A guest who stays with us in this particular room, they want this room to be turned into a yoga room. So we have to move away all the furniture completely and we get yoga mat, Buddha. As housekeepers, we are prepared for any such request and that's why the guests pay a premium for to come and stay with us. With fierce competition from London's hotel scene, Deborah hopes these personal touches and attention to detail extend across all of the 90 luxury bedrooms to make sure they stand out from the crowd. For those who can't quite afford the penthouse, the hotel's Duchess suites offer the same on a smaller scale. Duchess rooms we actually brought into our inventory um, around about five years ago. We're really short of rooms for great business travellers in London. So one of the things that I decided to introduce was just lovely things, what the female traveller is really looking for when they're away on business. So the sort of things that we brought into the room was the beautiful fresh flowers, the amenities, the personal welcome letter from myself, and the florist candle, of course. We work really, really close with florists. As perfumiers to the royal family, Floris holds a prestigious reputation. And with their showroom just around the corner from the hotel, they make bespoke scented candles for use in the guest rooms. Been here since 1730, and this is the original shop that was set up by my great, 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 great grandfather all those years ago. And we have um, fragrances that date back to the very first days, to the 1700s. The hotel and the perfumia, both historic institutions, work together with the aim of giving their customers memories that last. We're very proud that we supply Duke's Hotel. It's lovely to keep the spirit of St. James's alive, to all work together and celebrate our, our rich heritage. This is a fragrance called Sephiro. And this is um, the fragrance that we supply within the rooms. People will, will come in sometimes when they're staying at Dukes, other times afterwards, just because they want to be reminded of their, their stay. They've had such a wonderful time staying there and it's, it's been such a special memory for them. Surrounded by the waters of the Solent, Spitbank Fort also offers its own unique experiences. Anyone who can afford a night's stay in one of the nine bedrooms has the opportunity to travel back in time. The hotel's manager, Kyle Allen, is on hand to bring the proud history of this fort to life. Just through here, we can uh, sort of get our bearings of the entire fort. If you follow me, we'll head through into the courtyard and um, get a general orientation of Spitbank Fort. So from here, we can see the Victory Bar. Usually in the afternoon, we serve some afternoon tea through there. It's very popular. The chefs come through, send some fort-made cakes in from our modern galley. Here we're currently in a cannon deck. We have arrays here on the floor used to manoeuvre the direction of fire of cannons. And we've got hooks and eyes on the ceiling used to lift these guns up. Up to 10 tonnes apiece these guns will have weighed. Three times smaller than its sister No Man's Fort, this fort hopes to offer a boutique and intimate hotel experience. Okay, so making your way out of the modern accommodation, we'll head up and uh, take in the views around us. So you don't need to join a gym to work here. 
The unique setting of the fort gives visitors access to something totally different in the hotel world. We're heading past our fire pit here, so that'll be lit later on this evening. Blankets, marshmallows, tots of rum. It's all good fun. Just through here, we'll head through to the anti-aircraft platform. We are in the sort of heart of the historic Solent here. We've got the Mary Rose Boy, where um, the Mary Rose famously sank of its um, own accord. Henry VIII would have been at Southsea Castle to witness his pride and joy, the Mary Rose sink. From here, get a great view of Spitbank Fort itself. Although access to the sea may not be a problem on the forts, getting fresh running water out to their remote location was always a concern. You can almost see how the soldiers used to live out here. We've got eight wash basins just here, which was the only point of sanitation available for those 150 or so soldiers who used to stay on board. But as the venue was developed, the fort revealed that its previous occupants had come up with an ingenious solution. Thing that I love about this place is that we source our own water. So down in the lower parts of the fort, we have our own pump house. The forts have a well that goes through the sea, uh, through the seabed and into an underground river that comes from France. Forts were ironically built to defenders from the French, and now we're sort of stealing their water, so that, that's quite fun. The best taste in water ever as well. <laughs> when I go back on land, I find it really hard to drink water from the taps over there because out here we have the best water. Sparkling spit and still spit. No Man's Fort also has its own underground well, but it takes more than their artisan water for the hotels to meet their guests' high expectations. With only one restaurant in each hotel and the closest alternative, a choppy boat trip away on the Isle of Wight, executive chef Paul Golding has to work hard to ensure his menus cater to every taste. I'm a local boy, so I enjoy uh, everything that's about Portsmouth, but the forts especially. I looked out on them all my life and then I end up working here, so it's really good. We run our menus seasonally, so you get four changes of menus a year, spring, summer, autumn and winter. So in the spring and the summer and summer of autumn, food's quite abundant. All the fresh produce from the Isle of Wight and Hampshire, etc., we can use. Providing fine dining in the middle of the sea not only relies on having the right skills, but no small measure of creativity in the kitchen. We've had occasions where we have been stuck on here for a couple of days. And so we've had to do things like um, stretch the food out. We always have a few tricks up our sleeve. We make our own bread, so you can make a different sort of bread for the next day. We're in the sea, so there's plenty of fresh fish around. So we have to uh, just be a bit clever, really. Luckily for Paul, the weather hasn't stopped his experienced team of chefs making it to the fort's kitchen because today they have to prepare for a very special event. We're prepping today for a, what we call a Fort Discovery Lunch. So I've got um, 65 non-residential people coming over and we're going to um, give them a free course lunch, which includes a chestnut and duck terrine with truffle oil and sticky fig relish. And then we're following that with French corn fed chicken, with braised cabbage and nice fresh tender stem broccoli. With the success of today's event hinging on Paul and his team serving 195 plates of the highest quality food, he's asked his senior pastry chef, Maya, to come up with some ideas for a new seasonal dessert to wow their guests. She'll create you a unique birthday cake. She'll create you unique chocolate. Uh, she only asked me to order the best ingredients. We're using uh, cocoa berry chocolate, single origin. 
you can actually single out each plantation that the, the chocolate comes from. So we have them from Tanzania, from Dominican Republic and uh, Mexico, for example, and you can really taste the difference uh, in these chocolates, uh, which I'm trying to pick for our guests. She's always looking in books. She goes for a lot of work experience in places like Harrods. Anything she can to gain a bit of an experience. And she brings that back to the fort and she blows us all away. With the final edition of some gold leaf, Maya finishes her latest creation. It's basically a vodka and gin uh, cheesecake with uh, summer pickles and uh, toasted marshmallow. I love to surprise and inspire our guests, so we do put our heart and soul into what we are serving uh, to our guests and um, I, I do hope that they uh, enjoy staying over. I'm happy to assist you. Which restaurant would you like? At Duke's Hotel, executive head chef Nigel Mendham believes in sourcing only the finest ingredients to create his one-of-a-kind dishes. So the restaurant here is um, all-day dining. We open from 12 at lunchtime all the way through till 10.30. The philosophy of the food is uh, sharing plates, so we do small plates, large plates. We have to be five-star expectations all the time. You know, what we produce, what we do, what we use, everything has to be five-star. As part of the hotel's Great British Restaurant, Nigel and his team are proud to have classic dishes on the menu, but with a difference. And today it's full steam ahead as they prepare for a fully booked lunch sitting. Just good homely cooking like this one is a good example really. It's a shepherd's pie that you'd get at home, but we just put a little twist on it and make it a bit more interesting for the customer instead of just coming for a shepherd's pie basically. It's a bit more, you know, oh wow. A little bit of salt on it. So we're just going to seal the meat first. Well, because we're in London, I mean, the places to eat is quite diverse of where people can go. So we get we get in-house guests come down, but also we have outside guests walk in as well. Um, we have quite a, a mixture, varied clientele. Then once that's sealed off all sides. Just going to put it in the oven for six, six or seven minutes, just a nice medium rare. Then we're going to let it rest. And while it's resting, we're just going to do the uh, shepherd's pie up. Everything we do is predominantly British ingredients, which there's no point buying something that's mediocre and trying to make it work because it doesn't happen. You know, you buy a bad cut of meat or something you stand no chance of um, making it good. So yeah, quality ingredients, great team, success. And then the lamb sauce to finish the plate. With lunch over, Diners are free to explore the sights and sounds of the city. For many customers, part of the appeal of staying at the hotel is having some of the capital's most luxurious boutiques on their doorstep. So to give her guests that truly special shopping experience, it's up to Deborah to maintain great relationships with these local businesses. Hi Mike, morning. How are you? Good to see you. Good, good to see you, good yeah. I was just passing so I thought I'd pop in. Founded in 1676, Lock & Co is the world's oldest hat shop and a favourite venue for some guests who specifically choose to stay at the hotel while they get measured up for their new bespoke headwear. The thing about Lock & Co is it's very much um, the opposite of any sort of corporate business you can think of. If you work here, you become part of the family. There's almost like a sense of being at home. You know, I think when people come here, the space is there, so we don't jump on people. It's their place, their little sort of secret. They know, and places like Jukes, I think, sort of a really sort of at the forefront of that because effectively it's it's a little bit hidden, it's a little bit special, and I think it's you know it's a place that other people wouldn't sort of know. So I think for the people that do know, it's something quite special you know, in that respect. Whilst the location of the London Hotel gives its clientele unlimited access 
to some of the capital's best shopping and culture, guests who choose to stay on Solent Forts are able to fully disconnect from the stresses of daily life thanks to their remote location two kilometres off the historic naval city of Portsmouth. It's this remote location which gives logistics manager David Martin and his team the challenge of making sure that both fort locations are kept fully stocked to provide for their guests every need. There is no other companies out there doing what we're doing, so the logistics side of things has, we've had to learn it ourselves. Trucks don't just pull up outside and we unload straight into the kitchens. It has to come here. The best way to sort of look at it would be sort of import-export. So everything comes in on the Tuesday and then on the Wednesday it all gets shipped out and then again on Thursday it all comes in again fresh and then it all goes out on Friday. So nothing here is kept. It is all sort of comes in and goes out within sort of 24 hours. With over 60 guests due to arrive for their discovery lunch on No Man's Fort in just a few hours, it's up to David and his crew to make sure today's kitchen delivery arrives on time. So as you can see today, there is a bit of spray coming over the side. Uh, the deck is getting wet. You know, you've got to get everything on pallets, up off the floor. You've got other sort of lighter goods all in the hard boxes, so they can't get wet at all. Thanks to the weather, by the time David and his team dock their boat at the fort, they're already running behind schedule. And to make matters worse, as they begin to unload their precious cargo, another boat arrives, which could mean an even bigger delay. Tip. That's the boat that's coming to get the guests. So we might, we might just have to pull away. because our timing's off a little bit today. That is the boat that's coming to collect the guests. So the barge is just gonna pull away for 10 minutes, let that come in, let the guests disappear, and then we'll carry back on. From the gangway above, an anxious executive head chef, Paul Golding, can only hope he'll still get his 195 plates of food out on time. give way to the guest boat and uh, now that they have gone we come back alongside and carry on unloading all the stores. Have you asked him about that cress? <laughs> Why is that stuff not in a box? If you jump off there I'll lower it down. With their vital supplies finally being unloaded it's time for the staff to step it up a gear. Uh, we're a bit pushed for time. Obviously, the guest boat is on, on the way now. Uh, we're going to get all turned around in the next sort of 15, 20 minutes to get all the guests welcome on board. Um, obviously, the food's just arrived. Chef's going to unpack it all, cook it before lunch, uh, which we've got 64 people arriving very shortly. Um, bit of a mad time of the day, really. A lot's going on. No matter what happens, the show must go on, and we're always here, and we always deliver. It makes it more challenging and uh, certainly more fun. Guys, you've got 10 minutes until the boat comes. You're right to get all still cleared, yeah? Thank you very much. from them sitting down, so just making sure everything's ready, ready in a hot and tasty. It's organised chaos is what it is, but um, yeah, it's on time. Everything's on time, so it's always tight schedule. There's always something to catch us out, so we just do what we do.
Finally, in typical Fort style, lunch is called. main course going out so currently on the plate we've got a puree of fresh olive white tomatoes with truffle mash we've got uh, heritage carrots being roasted through with uh, star anise and honey and then we're finishing with some braised creamed cabbage and then on top of that we're going to put a nice breast of corn fed chicken so yeah it's a typical lunch and then finally I'm finishing it off with uh, a red wine and tarragon jus. Can I hurry up, please? <laughs> Despite a stressful morning getting their food shipment in for this event, the team on No Man's Fort have delivered the high-end cuisine they promised and on time. And all head chef Paul can do is make sure dessert is as good as the main course. Back in London, as guests return from a busy day on the town, there's no letting up for staff at Dukes. Good afternoon, Dukes London Concierge Ian speaking. How may I help? And in the hotel's drawing room, it's all about cakes. We have a lot of international guests coming to Duke's Hotel to stay here because it's a very quintessential British hotel and we are uh, very proud of our tradition. And one of the things that they say is that the afternoon tea here is very special and that they love Duke's because of it. We are an old hotel and all throughout the hotel you see the presence of history in our walls, in our paintings that we have. And so it is very important to keep the tradition of the afternoon tea alive. The most special thing about the afternoon tea is the experience that you have. You have your butler uh, serving you, serving your tea. We tend to not let people uh, grab the pot of tea so that you can have the whole experience of the aristocracy on the 18th century. I serve my guests the way I like to be served when I go where, wherever I go. So. Of course, it is very important to keep the guests happy and give them the attention that they want to have. The drawing room here was a favourite place to unwind for Diana, Princess of Wales. And like every aspect of the hotel, Deborah and her team aim to maintain the popularity of the drawing room by adding their own take on the traditional British afternoon tea. The martinis here at Dukes are very special and very famous. We felt the need to uh, have or to create a um, martini afternoon tea as well. So now we have mini martinis to pair with the food that we have in the afternoon. Dukes is renowned for many things, but one of the things that must be at its top of its list is its bar. People actually queue up to two hours to get into Dukes bar. It's said to be renowned for one of the best bars in the world. It's a great experience. I say it's more like theatre. It's not like going into war, it's like theatre. The man who holds centre stage here is world-renowned bar manager Alessandro Palazzi, who's been at the hotel 11 years. I rather walked in, in hotel than just a normal cocktail bar. Hotel is like a village. Bartending is not just making drink. That's the easy part. It's the experience you give. So like I said, this is more like a club. There's no music, there's no food. The noise comes from the drink, from us making noise. And that's the beauty about it. That's, it's not just making drinks, it's actually put people together. As a former haunt for author Ian Fleming, the martini here is said to be the inspiration for his famous hero James Bond's favourite tipple. 
Alessandro's now brought the drink right into the 21st century. So the most famous and why a lot of people come here is for the martini. But again, being Duke's Hotel, we don't like to do the classic way. We shake and stir in a different way. So first of all, what we do is Duke's Bar was the first one in the world to use a trolley, service trolley. And then my mentor to freeze the gin of vodka, so that's what we do, frozen the glass, so that's very important. I create with a small micro distillery in Highgate called Sacred, our own vermouth. Like I said, we like to do a little bit different. Instead of using a commercial vermouth, we create something which is very British. All the botanical come from UK, except the wine from Italy, where I come from, I have to put. And then we add a few drops. And people often say, do you shake or stir? I say both, so this is the stirring. This is the shaking, so I shake in the carpet. And then directly from the freezer, And again, another thing is we introduce organic lemon from Amalfi. We make a big twist and we squeeze the oil. Very simple, but the first thing that will come to your nose is the citrus and then the filling of the gin. But because it's frozen alcohol, frozen alcohol has got a delay reaction, we limit it to a person. Because also you have to think, what looks like a small glass, there's a five shot of pure alcohol. So it's quite strong like James Bond. <laughs> the ability of hotels like Solent Forts and Duke's London to try and provide their own special experiences day after day, no matter what the challenge is, is what they hope keeps their customers coming back. You're going to get off that boat not knowing what to expect, and from then on you're treated as a king or queen, and you're going to enjoy yourself. And once you get off, you're going to want to come back. For me, any guest who's coming to Duke's, I would love them to leave with a memory. I'd like them to leave with a smile on their face, with the fact that they thought, wow, I was really well looked after. The staff looked after me. They were there, and I didn't have to ask for anything. In the Solent, the Spitbank and No Man's Fort hotels are the realisation of a dream for owner Mike Clare had a rough idea of what I thought potentially they would end up like, which is sort of where they are, but there wasn't a budget and there wasn't an exact plan of how we were going to deal with the generators or the landing stages or, or the well and, and get all the licenses and, and all the things that we had to do. But I was just like, that was my passion. I just, it was my project, it's what I did, it's my hobby if you want. So it was just um, entrepreneurial sort of, I'm going to go for it and just do it and I'll make it work. It isn't your usual sort of five-star boutique hotel from the logistics of getting food and beverage on board to be delivered out here to um, Spitbank, um, to getting our guests to and from hotel as well. It's a very complex operation. Whether it's exploring history in the unique setting of the Solent Forts, or enjoying exclusivity and British regal elegance in the heart of London. It's thanks to dedicated staff that each guest's dream is turned into a reality. That's what Five Star Management is about. It's not just about doing great things on great days, it's about managing the challenging days also. We have had staff here who stay for years. You develop that sense of loyalty because you know you're part of something special. That is one of the classy hotels. Oh, I'd love to stay there, but a bit out of my price bracket, unfortunately. 